Welcome. My name is Anderson Cook, coordinator for Read SC, the South Carolina Center for the Book. On behalf of Read SC and our co-host this evening, the Georgia Center for the Book, I'd like to thank you for joining us for our ongoing On My Mind series, highlighting authors with Georgia and South Carolina connections. The format of tonight's talk will be a brief introduction, then our speaker for the evening, Karen White, will talk about her book, The Last Night in London, coming out April 20th. After the talk, we should have time for a few questions. There is a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that button, the question box will pop up and you can type in any questions you have. Feel, please feel free to enter questions at any point during tonight's talk. Now a little bit about our speaker. Karen White is the New York Times bestselling author of 28 books, including the Trad Street series, Dreams of Falling, The Night the Lights Went Out, and of course, many more. Raised in London with a house full of brothers, she developed a deep love of strong women characters after meeting Nancy Drew, thanks to a local librarian. She initially pursued a career in business before her love of writing eventually caught up with her. She has since been nominated for numerous national contests, including the Southeastern Booksellers Alliance Fiction Book of the Year. I could go on, but I wanna make sure she has time to share her work with us tonight. Please welcome Karen White. Thank you so much, Anderson, and, and thank you, uh, Georgia Center of the Book and South Carolina Center for the Book. Um, it's so funny because I live in Georgia. I've lived in Georgia for about, yeah, 29 years, 29 years, my gosh, but I'm only 30. How did that happen? Um, and until a few years ago, I had never written about Georgia. All of my books take place or had taken place. Most of them had taken place in either Charleston or any of those beautiful low country islands. I'd written about um, McClellanville, Polly's Island, Folly Beach, um, Edisto. Um, I mean, I could go on and on um, because I had such an affinity for South Carolina. Um, and I, I got lots of uh, emails from readers, you know, saying they'd read my bio and were so surprised that I hadn't grown up in South Carolina, that I didn't li live on, you know, Folly Beach with a dock at, you know, in my property, um, you know, where, and, and I would go sailing every day. And I think that's, I, it, that's a fair point because I have written so much about it. Um, and people have asked me, you know, well, well, if you didn't grow up here and you didn't grow up visiting here, which I didn't. Um, um, like uh, Anderson said in the intro, I did live in London for the longest time in my in my life. We lived there for seven years uh, when I was a child, well, teenager. Um, and at the time that was the longest I'd ever lived anywhere. My father's job with Exxon uh, kind of had us moving all over the place. Uh, you know, we lived in Venezuela, we lived in London, we lived um, in several of the states. I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, but I had, and we lived in the Netherlands for three years, but I had never lived in South Carolina. But the first time I visited when my children were very small, I remember smelling the pluff mud and just feeling like I was home. It was the strangest feeling. And at that point I wasn't a writer. I didn't dream of being a writer. Um, I'm one of this, those writers who sort of fell into it, who've always loved books and storytelling. But I did not enjoy writing as a child. I did not want to be a writer. I did not plan to be a writer. That's why I was a business major. Um, so yes, it was it was a surprise when I when I visited South Carolina. I felt so at home there. And um, it was only a couple of years ago uh, my daughter decided she wanted to do our ancestry um, in the hopes of joining the Daughters of the American Revolution because my father's family has been in this this country for so very long. And, um, and in the South. And she was positive that surely we had somebody, um, you know, that had fought in the revolution. And she actually found quite a few, but the interesting thing was that she found um, many in South Carolina, um, in, a, in and around Charleston and in Charleston on a meeting and Broad Streets. And I was sort of floored. Um, you know, there, there has been some evidence and, you know, and I'm a writer, I, I, I believe in, you know, exploring any anything interesting. And, and there is um, a lot of stories uh, that I've read about, about um, inherited memory. And I'm just, you know, I just wonder if that's, that's part of my connection to South Carolina, because as of this date, um, I have never lived there, I've never owned property there, um, but I still feel a very strong affinity for it. 
So um, as I as I alluded to, I was I I've always been a fan of books. Well, I was a fan of books starting third grade. Um, growing up, you know, my mother wasn't a reader. My father was a voracious reader, but he traveled a lot with his job, and he was really into nonfiction. And um, so it wasn't until I visited a library um, when I was living in Venezuela with my best friend. And I just went into the library because it was air conditioned. You know, Venezuela is on the equator, it's very hot. And um, I remember Mrs. Shero, the librarian, turning to me um, because I wasn't, you know, looking for books while my friend Tina was busy, you know, returning books and getting more books. And she said, Karen, what do you like to read? And I said, I don't. And you can imagine, because this was, yeah, third grade. So I was about eight or nine. And uh, Mrs. Shero was a little shocked. <laughs> And she turned around and she pulled a book from the shelf and it was um, The Secret of the Old Clock by Nancy Drew. And, um, and from then on, I was completely hooked. I just, it was such an experience. And I'm assuming if you're listening to this, you're a reader, you love books and you love that feeling you get when you are immersed in somebody else's world, you know, another setting, um, you know, you can place yourself in, in the, the hero or heroine's shoes and be braver than you think you are and do things that you never think you could do. Um, and just be immersed in another time period, um, you know, another lifetime, another, you know, anything, another life. And um, there's just something to be said about reading and, and the adventures that books take you on. And when I discovered that first Nancy Drew, I was hooked. Um, and I guess we lived in Venezuela for two years and probably by the end of those two years, I had read every single book, you know, and, um, you know, whether it was in my age group or not, I, I read them all. Um, and then I turned to my mother's uh, Ladies Home Journal. <laughs> I became a big fan uh, because at the time, Ladies Home Journal used to have, um, um, articles, you know, can this marriage be saved? And I'd always be, you know, um, reading them and, you know, being very concerned at a very young age. I'm, I'm pretty positive when my mother was not aware I was reading that. And I loved Good Housekeeping too, because they used to do the um, excerpts from novels. And, um, and then I would go beg my, my father to, because my mother, again, wasn't a reader. She didn't understand my fascination with books. So I would discover a book that, um, I had been excerpted in um, uh, Good Housekeeping and begged my father to go get it so I could read the rest of the book. And that's how I discovered Victoria Holt. Um, it was Lord of the Far Island. And that, that started my fascination with gothics. I mean, you know, Rebecca and all of those, um, anything by Victoria Holt. Uh, I just became a fan. And I think that's how all writers start. They, they don't start as being writers. And, and when, I, when I talk to people or, or people reach out to me, um, you know, oh, I want to be a writer. And my question is, oh, well, what do you like to read? And they'll say, oh, I don't have time to read. Well, I'm afraid you can't be a writer unless you're a reader. You have to understand the beats and the ups and downs and the... Um, just how, how it's done, um, how a story is told in a, in a wonderful way. And, um, and that's why, you know, I, I started out as being an avid reader and every, every one of my uh, writer friends and every one of my favorite writers, um, that's how they've all started by being avid readers. Um, many of them know from, you know, the, the moment they're in the cradle that they wanna be writers. And I was not one of those people and it wasn't until I was forced into learning how to type in 10th grade that I realized why I hated to write. So back in the old days, when I was in school, everything had to be handwritten. And I would be given the assignment, write a five page mystery, which meant, you know, I would write as big as I could. And then, you know, I'd be not even into the story when I turn it in and say, oh, ran out of pages. And and that, that stemmed from, you know, the times when I would be asked to write an assignment in classroom and I'd be so excited about the story and I'd start thinking about the story and I'd be handwriting it. And my, the story in my head would be on, you know, page 10 
and my handwriting would be on, you know, the second paragraph and I would get frustrated because I would forget all those cool things that was that were coming to my head and that I wanted to record for this book and I, it would just be a mess and I was always getting A plus for content and an F in handwriting. Um, and truly my handwriting <laughs> has not improved very much. Um, but I had to learn to type, um, and for those of you who are younger and don't know what a typewriter is, I had to learn on a manual typewriter. And because I had played uh, piano my whole life, I had good hand-eye coordination. So within a week, I was typing on a manual, you know, where you had to, you know, you had the return that you had to hit and use whiteout or the little, you know, correct, correction tape. I was ty typing 88 words a minute, and which is, you know, considerable. Um, now I type about a hundred words a minute because I have, you know, a wonderful laptop and a, you know, modern computer. And um, so it's, it's in 10th grade when I learned how to type, when my thought, when my writing could keep up with my thoughts, that's when it clicked to me why I had hated to write. But by then I had such a negative, negative feeling towards writing. I still loved creating stories. I loved reading, but I, there was no way I was, there was no way I was going to be a writer, even though my teachers were always saying, Karen, you're so creative. You're such a good writer. You know, you need to get over this and, and, and consider it. And of course I didn't because, you know, when you're that age, you don't listen to any adult. Um, and so I was a business major and, and plus I was a business major because my father, you know, paid for my education and he thought being a business major was a good idea. And I'm glad I did. I, I there's so much about, a writing career that is about marketing your book it, yourself your book um is you know it's it's a product that you need to market and promote and so I, I get that probably more than somebody who just started out being a writer um and i love i always get the question you know well surely when you were a child you you know kept a diary or a journal and so the answer to both is no. Um, I didn't keep a diary because I have three brothers and we all went to the same school and that would have been social suicide. And as far as a journal, the real answer is no, but kind of I did, uh, but that was really just a journal to keep track of what I wore each day. So I'd never repeat an outfit. So, uh, so no really to both, both those questions. Um, so I went to college, I graduated, I went to Tulane, I graduated with honors with a business degree, which is so not me. I don't know how I managed to do that. Um, I think it's because I'm stubborn and, and when I don't get something, I just try extra hard. Um, and so I, yeah, I graduated with honors. I worked in the business world. I got married. Um, and then four years later, I had my first child. And then I had my second child less than two years later. And, and I enjoyed being a stay at home mom, but you know, I also needed my time to read. So I was very, very uh, specific about my children's um, nap times. And um, yeah, so, you know, they, would, they were good nappers and I told them they had to be if they were going back. And um, yeah, so they would take like a four hour nap in the middle of the day, and then they would go to bed at eight and wake up at eight in the morning. And um, it was wonderful because that gave me time to read in the middle of the day. And then um, uh, my sister-in-law sent me Outlander by Diana Gabaldon. And if y'all have not read that book, put it on your list, um, but go ahead and buy the next, the other books in the series because you're not going to want to stop up when you reach the end of the first book. And that's what happened to me. Um, when she told me about this, she's this book, Outlander, she was like, well, it's time travel. It's, you know, this, the second, uh, second world war and it's, you know, Scotland. And I was just like, you know, I'm not sure. She's like, trust me. So I said, okay. And it was a really, really thick book. And my, um, my son was, you know, an infant. And when I would be feeding him, um, I'd be reading. And um, I think that's why he has a permanent, permanent divot in his forehead from, you know, they're heavy books, you know, and this, the corner would, would be resting on his forehead. I'm, I'm just kidding about that. But it, it was, you know, because when you get in a book, you know what it's like, you can't put it down even to feed your child. And um, I would take my, my children to the park, and I'd bring the book and I would put them in swings, and I would push them and I'd be reading this book and I'd be pushing. And, you know, Four hours later, the kids would be like, mommy, it's raining, it's cold, it's dark, we're hungry, can we go and can we go home? And I'd be like, just one more page, one more chapter. Because um, I was totally, totally into this book. And then 
Um, I went, you know, I went ahead and bought the rest of the books in the series. At the time, there was only about four, I think, and I just read them, and then I read them again, and um, um, I, I just became, you know, uh, I had what, and again, if you are a, if you are an avid reader, you know what a book hangover is, and that's what I had with these Outlander books. Um, I would have, you know, as, as avid readers, as we are, we have stacks of books waiting to be read. And I had stacks of books and they were all perfectly great books that I knew I would enjoy, but I had such a book hangover with Outlander. I could not get myself off those pages out of that world, away from those characters. I was completely hungover. And, um, and so I did what any, any reader <laughs> does um and any clueless individual because i was thinking you know i i really sat down one day without any plans but just i was desperate because i couldn't read another book i would try and i would just my head would just wander to scotland and jamie and claire and um and so i sat down one day and i started writing my own book and again i had no no plans no you know, and I would write when I, those were the good old days when I could write when I felt like it, you know, because I still had two young kids at home, but they were good nappers. Um, so I would write when they napped and, um, you know, and, and first I had, I had my first sentence and then I had a paragraph and then I had a page and oh my gosh, then I had a chapter. And, um, and, you know, I'd had to take creative writing in high school and college in my um, pre-business classes. And, um, you know, but but my biggest training was just reading um, and, and, and sort of intuitively absorbing how authors, authors I enjoyed, how they wrote the books that I enjoyed to read. Um, and that's basically how I wrote my first book. Um, I didn't really tell anybody about it. I wasn't, I mean, there was no way I could get published. I mean, this is what, I wasn't a writer. I mean, this wasn't what I was planning on doing. And then I found out from um, an online friend about this writer's group and how it was a national group and how, you know, they offered um, um, contests. And, you know, if you join the national group, they had local chapters and, and they did these national contests. And, um, oh, look, look at this contest. The finalist judge um, is a New York literary agent. And if you win, your manuscript will be read and critiqued by Diana Gabaldon. And I was like, oh, well, I'm never going to win. But, you know, there's nothing to lose here. So I, I, I joined the organization. I submitted my manuscript. And lo and behold, I ended up winning. And not only did I get an offer of representation from this agent, but I also um, got a lovely um, um, critique by Diana. And it was just, you know, that was the beginning. Again, I, you know, it was a fluke, of course, you know, of course it's a fluke. It's a beginner's luck. And my agent sold it, sold it. Um, she sold my next book. Um, she sold my first four books. Um, both were with small New York publishers. So, you know, I didn't expect any more. So that was fine. Um, and then that second publisher dropped me. I'm like, okay, well, that was a good run while it lasted. But at the, that time, I was writing my first South Carolina book, um, The Color of Light, which is set on Polly's Island. And, um, you know, my agent said, you know what? Uh, Penguin Random Penguin uh, Publishing, which wasn't part of Random House at the time, is really interested in this. Um, let Let's wait before before you quit your career before it's even started. Let's wait and see what they have to say. And sure enough, they came back with an offer that I mean, I was just you know floored. I couldn't believe it. Um, I mean, this was one of the biggest publishers in the world, and they wanted to publish my book, you know, right when I was on the verge of quitting, because I thought, obviously, this isn't for me. Um, and yeah, and that that is really the beginning of my career, my real career. Um, that's, you know, I went on from there to be, uh, become a, a New York Times bestselling author. More, more I think 12 of my books have, have been on the New York Times list. Um, it's just been, it's been incredible. And I guess after the 10th book, I stopped thinking it was a fluke. Um, but I, I think the importance is to always approach each book as I did the first book, which is, I just want the right to write the kind of book 
that I love to read. And that is my goal each time uh, because I am first and foremost a reader. Um, and yeah, that, that's still what I write. So um, I write what people call Southern women's fiction. That's just a label. It doesn't really mean anything. It just helps people shelve it in, you know, in the library or, or bookstore. Um, but I like reading a writing about strong women um, that have definitely been um, my influences were my aunts uh, from and grandmother from um, Southern Mississippi. And um, so I love writing about strong women, female characters, my books are always set in the South. It's what I know. It's where my family is from. Um, and I like a little bit of mystery, a little bit of a love story, but mostly it's always about the journey of this main character who usually at the beginning of the book is in a hole that she has either dug for herself or circumstances has dug for her. And she does not believe she has the strength or doesn't know she has the strength to crawl out and, and move forward. And so my, my characters are always at sort of a crossroads in their lives at the beginning and um, they sort of have to figure it out. But I love history. So there's usually um, a historical element in all of my books and that mystery element, um, but it's a woman's journey and I use humor. Um, and I also write about some poignant, serious issues as well. But I think I try to write about real life because real life is about, you know, it's laughter and tears. And I try to evoke both in all of my books. Um, I laugh and cry while I'm writing my books. So that's a good thing. Um, I also write a series set in Charleston, which is sort of, again, it was a fluke. I was happily writing my Southern fit, uh, women's fiction books. And one day in the shower, the main character, Melanie Middleton, just reached out and slapped me over the head. And I thought, oh, OK, she, I need to write a book with this character because she's really interesting. She's OCD. She sees dead people. And, <laughs> and she doesn't like seeing dead people, but she's a realtor and sells old houses. Um, and of course, that that is what started the Trad Street series, which is set in Charleston. Um, it's what I call my Sixth Sense meets National Treasure meets Moonlighting. Uh, for those of you who remember the Sybil Shepherd and Bruce Willis series back in the 80s, um, because it's sort of that back and forth banter. So there's a lot more humor, but there's ghosts in that one too. But it's not about the ghost. All of my books, including the Trad Street series, are definitely character based. Um, they're character-driven, character-based. We have all these cool subplots and secondary characters. And in the Trad Street series, we have the ghosts, but those are all subplots and secondary to the hero's journey, which is um, uh, really what drives my stories. Um, so my next book, The Last Night in London, um, that comes out on April 20th. I'm very excited about it. Um, and it is sort of a book, the book that is my most personal book yet because it draws on um, not only my personal life from when I lived in London, um, but also because I have used two characters from three different books um, to sort of reconcile their stories in this book. Now, this isn't a sequel. You don't have to have read those earlier books, um, but I have been getting, um, mail for a very for about 10 years since after the rain and falling home came out um, where there is a, a character maddie warner who in falling home she's 14 and after the rain she's 18 and readers have been asking me for over a decade what happens to maddie after the end of after the rain so this tells her story she's a young woman now she's 28 she is a freelance journalist and she has been hired uh, so she's from southern georgia very Southern, very Georgian. Uh, for those of you who read those first two books, you'll understand uh, where she's coming from. It is a small, small town of the fictional town of Walton and their welcoming sign says, you know, where everybody knows, um, where everybody is somebody, that's on the welcome sign. And that's, that's the town that Maddie has grown up in. Um, but of course there are things in her past that have been holding her back and, um, she, uh, a friend of hers that she met junior abroad in England, um, invites her. She is now, her friend is now an editor with Vogue and they, she is looking for a journalist to interview and write the story of Precious DuBose, who was a fashion model during um, 
before and during World War II in both London and Paris. And it is Precious Dubot's 100th birthday. And she has donated all of her clothes to the London um, Museum of Fashion. And of course, Vogue is going to be covering it. So they want this extra interview uh, to go with the coverage. Um, so of course, you know, Maddie's like, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun, very straightforward. So she flies to London. And by the way, the setting for this book is Harley House, which is the building, the Edwardian building built in 1904, where I lived for seven years. So in both the past and the present day, that's uh, the setting for these characters. That's where they live. Um, so it's kind of fun revisiting my home. Um, but of course, you know, when Maddie starts interviewing Precious DuBose, who you might recognize from All the Ways We Said Goodbye, which is one of the collaborations I've written with Lauren Willig and Beatrice Williams that came out last year. Um, so Precious DuBose, we meet her in that book in 1964. So this is years later, it's her 100th birthday. So we get to sort of learn a little bit about her backstory because this book goes back in time to the Blitz, the London Blitz and modern day. And Maddie starts interviewing Precious about her time, um, fashion in a time of crisis. So it seems like a very simple assignment. But of course, as Maddie starts peeling back the layers and Precious starts peeling back the layers of Maddie's story, um, they come to recognize a shared a shared burden and a share, shared hopefulness that, and this unexpected bond um, that neither one of them anticipated um, as they start sharing their secrets with each other and finding healing in this very unexpected friendship. Um, yeah, so, so that's the genesis of the story. But um, the reason why I've, I've been thinking about this book for so long is when we moved into Harley House, our our doorman explained to us the reason why half the windows in the flat were playing glass and the other half were lead, leaded glass was because during the blitz, um, bombs landed very nearby and shattered, shattered them. So they were replaced with plain glass. And I remember at the time thinking, oh my gosh, you know, this is history you can hold in your hand. And, and you know, being the imaginative type, um, there were many nights I, I just laid in bed thinking about, all of the people that had lived in that flat and had slept in my bedroom, um, you know, during this amazing time, um, this this scary time. I mean, the Blitz was when the German Air Force bombed London for almost nine months of nightly raids. I mean, if you can imagine that, and um, and to think that my flat survived that. Um, it's, it's really incredible. And, um, and I, I knew it was a story waiting to be told. Of course, when I read it, I didn't, um, uh, I mean, when it happened to me, I didn't anticipate that um, I would ever be a writer and that I would ever write the story of the people I imagined having lived in that building and in that flat. Um, so that, that is that book. And because, you know, it was 2020 last year, why not write two books? So I have another book coming out November 2nd. And for those of you who are fans of the Trad Street series, that is book number seven and the final book in the series. And it is called The Attic on Queen Street. And for those of you who know and love Charleston, you know that Queen Street is a beautiful street in Charleston, gorgeous old homes. And, um, and this, so it does, it ties up. For those of you who read the penultimate book, The Christmas Spirits on Trad Street, I've gotten enough email to know that y'all did not appreciate the ending because things were left at loose ends. But of course they were left at loose ends because there was one more book to come. And that will be The Attic on Queen Street. Um, it will tie everything up. It will answer all questions. But the best news is that that technically won't be the last. I've been asked to do a spinoff series and that will be set in New Orleans. And the first book, The Shop on Royal Street will be out the fall of 2022. And the main character will be Nola Trenum, who you've met in the Trad Street series and another character who you will meet in the attic on Queen Street. So there will be a lovely continuation. We will still have visits from Melanie and Jack and the twins and all the other characters that you've grown um, to love and, and enjoy. Um, and even the dogs, I mean, why, well, maybe not the dogs because it's like 10 years later, but 
we'll figure something out. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. Um, uh, right now I have a contract for two books in the series. Hopefully it will be um, go on from that. And I am currently thinking about my next single title. It might be another Low Country book. It's, it's been a couple of years since I've been to the Low Country. That last one was um, Dreams of Falling, uh, which took place in Georgetown, South Carolina, right uh, north of Charleston. So, um, so I think that is, um, I think that's me in a nutshell. Um, Anderson, are we ready to go to questions or is there anything else I have not covered and need to talk about? Oh, wait, excuse me. I have two books out next year. Not only do I have the sequel or the first book in the Trad Street series, but my next collaboration with Lauren Willig and Beatrice Williams. Um, we have no title yet. We're two thirds of the way through, but it is set in Newport, Rhode Island during the 1890s and the 1950s and modern day. Very exciting. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, this has been so wonderful. Um, as a reminder to everyone attending tonight, um, please enter your questions in the Q&A box and we will have Karen answer them as we go. Um, but I want to go ahead and get started with one. Um, you said earlier that a big part of reading is immersing yourself in another world. And I am curious, what author's worlds do you love to immerse yourself in aside from Outlander? Right. You know, and um, I thought maybe it's because of, of my father who had such an eclectic reading taste, although, you know, different subject matter, but always, you know, nonfiction. I love everything. Um, I've really, I've really been um, deep diving into historical fiction recently with um, Stephanie Dre's the, uh, the Women of Chateau Lafayette, which is fabulous. Erica Roebuck, uh, the Invisible Woman about a real, uh, oh my gosh, a real spy operative during the war. Brilliant book, amazing history that you don't know and you need to know. This was a, a, an incredible woman. Um, and I just finished a book today. It's not, uh, it's a couple of, uh, but I, I've really been getting into the domestic thrillers. Uh, Ruth Ware, for instance, um, I just finished, oh, and also um, Simone St. James. She does sort of spooky. Um, and I just finished uh, The Sundown Motel. Um, and the book that I'm currently listening on audio is um, Ghosted by, I know I know her name. I can't think of her name, <laughs> but ghosted. It is wonderful. And I've just been given a, a book, uh, a historical fiction to read for a blurb. And this author is becoming one of my favorite authors because she writes about exotic places. And her name is Jenny Ashcroft. And her first book, Meet Me in Bombay, of course, is set in Bombay, India. And this book is set in Australia. So I feel like, you know, I'm reading the Thornbirds again. I'm totally, totally into this new world that, um, you know, I'm visiting Australia, you know, sitting, sitting in my, in my home. Um, but my go-to's always like automatic buys for me are Kate Morton. Uh, she is, uh, she is a new, a, a, an Australian author, I believe. Every, every one of her books, e, e, they're, they're just amazing. Um, and of course I'm, I'm forgetting everybody else. There are just so many great authors that, that are auto buys for me. Um, and I, I'm always surprised when I miss one. So I try to always make sure that I sign up for their alerts, you know, but there's only so much time I have. Believe me, it's so much more fun to read a book than to write one. <laughs> I'm one of those writers, um, I can't remember who said it, but a famous writer said, might've been Eudora Weldy, I don't remember, um, said, I don't enjoy writing, I enjoy having written. And that is 100% the truth for me. Writing is hard, reading is fun. <laughs> I always love to get a perspective um, from an author to share what they've been reading and what they're into because it really can be revelatory and yep. you are clearly very well read. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if not writing, what do you think you would have ended up doing? I know you said you were in business for a while um, and then a stay-at-home mom, but where do you think you would have ended up if not for writing? You know, and, and it's funny because I, I, my daughter... I would have her career. So she, she, um, I guess our love for old houses, you know, um, obviously uh, my love for old houses and her love for, you know, 
who I am did not, you know, this apple didn't fall far from the tree because she is doing exactly what I would have done. Um, so she has a graduate degree from the College of Charleston in historic uh, preservation. She actually worked for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And now she is the architectural historian for a civil engineering firm. So yeah, you know, to be up close and personal with the old houses and their histories, that would be, yeah, that would be my thing. And of course she works as a docent um, for um, a historical property in the DC area, which is where she lives. So yeah, if, if I weren't writing and I had time to do fun stuff like that, that's what I would be doing. To be able to interact with history in a very tangible way. Yes, I, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so another question I have. Um, you clearly write books set in the South very often, but not all of your books are set in the South. How do you think setting affects your writing and your stories? Right. Um, so setting for me, and it's fun. And, and I think what, you know, we're asked many times, we meaning Lauren, Beatrice and I about our collaborations, you know, why we write them. We, we didn't have, we all had successful, we still have very successful, you know, um, um, solo careers. So why, why did we do this? And I think it's important, in, no matter what you do career wise, um, I think it's important to sort of stretch your boundaries, you know, exercise those mental muscles. And that's why when we write these books, you know, I pick really um, out of character characters for me. I pick settings that aren't, you know, thing, settings I haven't written about before. But for those of you who have read my books, you know that my settings are really as much a character as the actual characters. So there can never be a book setting that I write that I don't respond to. Um, you know, All the Ways We Said Goodbye is set in France. I can relate to France. <laughs> uh, uh, this is, you know, this is London. Um, this is where I lived. Um, Atlanta, I, I've written my Atlanta book because I've lived here for 28 years. Um, you know, because I get a lot of emails like, oh, you need to come to Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard or, you know, Sedona. And I've been to all those places and they're absolutely gorgeous, but I don't get that feeling for them, you know. Um, and that's why that that's sort of uh, it's important. I can't just, you know, pick a place out of the hat and, um, you know, write about it because I, I really need to have that inspiration that is that comes from the actual setting. Absolutely. Um, and congratulations on the spinoff of the Trad Street series. Of course, uh, we have we can congratulate you on many of your other endeavors. But I was curious about your connection to New Orleans. Obviously, it's a setting that inspires you. But I wanted you to talk a little bit more about, more about your connection to New Orleans. Right. So I, um, I went to Tulane University, which is in New Orleans. Um, so two of my best friends um, are from there. And they're still my best friends. Um, again, it, it is that sort of feeling I got from there. I mean, New Orleans and Charleston are very similar. Um, although, you know, I like to say that New Orleans is like the older tawdry sister, you know, <laughs> um, they're so similar yet so different. Um, but they're both so unique. Um, I do, I mean, the architecture in New Orleans, the history, um, you know, I'm not one of those um, uh, Bourbon Street kind of people or, you know, even a Mardi Gras kind of person. Um, I was lucky enough when I lived in New Orleans to go to two Mardi Gras balls. And that's the way you need to do New Orleans to Mardi Gras. You don't want to be out on the streets, you know. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, just so such a special, special place and will always have a special place in my, my heart. Um, and what is really interesting is that when I first came up with the, the story for the house on Trad Street, the name, the title in that book was, was going to be the house on Britannia. Britannia is in the guard district of New Orleans. So that series was meant to be set in New Orleans. Um, and then that was 2005. And we all know what happened in 2005, a little storm called Katrina happened to New Orleans. And I knew this story that I had imagined um, 
I had to find another setting because Katrina was too big. It, it couldn't be a subplot or a sub story that it just wasn't the story. Um, I did go back to write my homage to the Gulf Coast in New Orleans in the beech trees a few years later, but I knew this series need to find another home. Um, and so, of course, I thought, you know, all right, what's well, another great southern city with plenty of history, lots of gorgeous old houses, and of course, plenty of ghosts, and naturally, you know, Charleston bingo. Um, and so it was kind of serendipitous. I think the Tried Street series belong there. And, uh, and now I get to go back to New Orleans where it was originally planned. So it's sort of um, kismet, I guess, um, serendipity, I don't know, but it's, it's, I'm so excited. I've, I've, I'm only on chapter three. It's just been a very difficult year uh, <laughs> so far. It's like 2020, but, but on steroids. And, um, uh, but I, I mean, I just can't wait to get back to this uh, book. And I realized today as I was writing, you know, one of the joys of writing The Last Night in London was that that was set in my flat that I lived in for seven years. Well, guess where Nola Trenum lives in New Orleans? Well, she lives in my apartment that I lived in in college. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's really fun. Like, I, I know the parking problems. I know what's next door. I know it's across the street. It's amazing. It's like it's like revisiting my youth again. Which I'm sure is really exciting and also oh, it is. It unexpected. Is. Yes, yes. Because it was kind of a long time ago that I was in college, you know, at least 10 years. Short, short time, short time ago. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask, plenty of authors write and only ever write on their own. And you have several collaborations now with not just one author, but multiple. And I would love to hear what drew you to that writing process and what keeps bringing you back. Right. So my first kind of collaboration, or it, it was, um, it was uh, not. I can't think of the word. Uh, the word. It's not. It wasn't an anthology. It was a continuing novel where you know each a different author. It was all set in the same plays, and each author wrote a story. And that was like the first published work I had, and that was with Bell Books. And um, I wasn't published at the time, and. And they did a call out, anybody want to write a story for the, the Mossy Creek series? And I was like, well, I've never been published before. This could be my chance. And so I did. I love my story. I love that whole uh, collaboration. But that, you know, once I did it, that was good. I'm, I'm glad I did it. Um, I'm still getting royalties. And that came out 15 years ago. Yeah. I mean, like $8 royalties. But still, you know, I'm very proud of this. And I think Bell Books does an awesome job of writing. You know, it's an independent bookseller. They do great Southern stories. Definitely check them out at bellbooks.com. Um, and then I was approached to do an anthology by an author friend of mine. I'd never done an anthology. And it was all going to be set around Grand Central Station. Like every story had to start in Grand Central. And then we had complete autonomy um, oh, and it had to be on uh, Armistice Day or D-Day, excuse me, D-Day. Um, and, and it had to, you know, be set at or start at Grand Central Station in New York City. And, you know, again, like I said before, there's, you can never get too complacent in whatever you do. If you want to really be the best at what you do, you need to always stretch those muscles. Um, kind of take a chance, step out of your comfort zone. Um, and, and I thought, gosh, why not? <laughs> and so I did. I love that. That was, um, it was called Grand Central. It it's, uh, still sells. It's still for sale. Definitely check it out. Lots of great authors in there, including uh, Christina McMorris and um, Sarah McCoy, uh, Allison Richmond, just fabulous stories. I highly recommend it. But so that was my first anthology. And then I did that and I'm, I'm glad I did it. Do I want to do another? Probably not. Um, not that I had a bad experience. It was just like, okay, I've done it. That was, you know, that was fun while it lasted, but it's not something that excited me, you know, but I'm glad to know I can do it. And that, that was great. And then, I mean, a collaboration never entered my mind until I was at a writer's conference and in a bar, of course, because, you know, that's where all great stories happen. And um, I had been fans and friends with uh, Beatrice and Lauren for a number of years. We all wrote for Penguin at the time. And we were just sitting at the bar and we were just talking. And 
and we just were just getting so silly. Um, and we were like, oh my gosh, you know, it's so boring to go on book tour by, by yourself. And the bar bill is so expensive. It would be so much fun if we could, so much more fun if we could like go on book tour together and like, you know, have a publisher pay our bar bill. And um, so we're like, well, gosh, we, we should write together. <laughs> And that's honestly, and the next thing I know, I'm flying up to New York to meet with Beatrice and Lauren, um, you know, to start plotting out the first book, The Forgotten Room. And it was, I have to say, none of us knew what we were doing. We had no expectations. Um, but within five minutes, we realized that we had something. We had this magic relationship that we knew we were checking our egos at the door, we each loved each other's writing, although we wrote very differently. We loved each other's and respected each other's voices. And we knew that this was going to be an exciting adventure. And when we wrote that first book, it got published. It hit the New York Times list. And we were like, whoa, OK, that was a lot of fun. And that book tour was really fun. <laughs> so um, so we've done it uh, three times now. And yes, we've we're working on our fourth book now that's already contracted. and. Um, it will be out next year. So we, we, we just, it is, it's such a cathartic sort of experience because we all work on our own books while we're working on the, the collaboration. And we like to call it our um, productive procrastination because, you know, when you're working on your own book, you're like, you know, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, bing, because we write round robin, you know, so the author before me will, will email me the book when they're done with their chapter. And then it's my turn to write my chapter. And, um, and it's like, oh, thank goodness. So I can kind of switch focus. And by the time I'm done with that chapter for the collaboration, I'm ready to go back to my solo work. And we all feel that way. And um, it's just such a wonderful, exuberant, mind muscle stretching exercise. And, um, and we've, we've really become super close friends. And it's, it's one of those friendships that like, I feel like we've known each other forever. So it's, it's, it's wonderful. I, I hope we get to do this forever. I imagine that in addition to the wonderful friendship that has developed, it really has become a great tool for addressing writer's block. In oh, other no, places. absolutely. And even, and it's so funny because we trust each other's judgment so much that even when we're stuck on one of our own books, like we'll just send out a text, like, okay, so I'm doing this, 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 and this, like, I was thinking this, but what about this? And like, you know, so we chime in and it's because when you're writing by yourself, you answer that quite, you ask that question, what if blah, blah, blah. And you're answered with crickets because you're sitting in your room by yourself. But when you're writing collaboration, you just, what about, and then, you know, we have these wonderful text chains that after we're dead, we will publish because they kind of go off on the funniest tangents that, you know, <laughs> that are really fun, <laughs> but better not for public consumption until we are long dead. <laughs> yeah, I think it's safe to say that whether it is personal or professional, it's great to have a trusted group of people around you. Absolutely. It is the bubble. We call ourselves the Unibrain and Team W because we all, our last names all start with W. And um, it's it's really, a, you know, it is the Team W bubble. We, we just know that whatever we tell each other is, you know, sacred. And um, there we are. I think we have time for one more question. And so yeah. I'm going to end on um, this last night in London, last night in London. So you said that readers had been asking you for a very long time, what happened to Maddie from After the Rain? And I want to know, how did you decide or perhaps realize that these two other characters from two different stories that you'd written were now all part of each other's one Great big story. Right. Um, so I knew I had, I mean, for a long time, I knew I had to find the right story for Maddie. And I also knew for a long time that I needed to set a book in London as an American ex expatriate. And I love fish out of water stories, especially, you know, my mother's from Southern Mississippi. So you can imagine, you know, when we moved to London, how fun that was for her. Not really <laughs> people making fun of her accent all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and in England, like they don't have accents, right? And um, so I knew that was inevitable. And then when we wrote the night, the uh, excuse me, all the ways we said goodbye, so much reader email to the three of us about 
I want to hear more of Precious's story or Precious is my favorite character. And, you know, there was so much that was, you know, Precious alludes a lot to her life. So Precious's story in that book is 1964. So she alludes a lot to her story during the war. And she has a huge backstory there that, you know, obviously there's no room in that book to tell, but surely another book, you know? And so I thought, well, this is it. This is the time to merge them all together. So it was, it was you know, the, the wonderful coming together and it just made the, the book so much more fun to write knowing that I had these, these special characters that had been waiting uh, for their book. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Karen. I really appreciate you sharing with us tonight. And I want to thank everyone who attended for joining us. Um, I want you all to know that um, I have linked in our chat, uh, link to Karen White's website, as well as the readsc.org website and the Georgia Center for the Book. Um, as a reminder, the book is coming out the last night in London. It's coming out April 20th to purchase a copy please visit Eagle Eye Bookshop, the local independent bookseller we are featuring this evening. Yeah, and you can also pre-order the book now. So they have it for you. You can pick it up on pub date. So, and thank you. Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Anderson, so much. And thank you all for, of course, allowing us to come into your homes. Don't forget, this is an ongoing series for us in Read SC, the South Carolina Center for the Book. And on May 6th, we will be featuring local Atlanta author Anjali Anjetti. This is her first novel to be published. It's called The Parted Earth. It is about the partition in India and takes place in 1947, as well as contemporary Atlanta. It sort of travels back between the decades and about these families. Um, she also is a very talented author and has another book out from UGA Press called Southbound that features her essays. Um, she's been a journalist for years. Um, this book is also out from Hub City Press in South Carolina. So it is the perfect, perfect example of the great relationship for the On My Mind series. So we invite you to go ahead and put that date on your calendar and we will have tickets available for you to sign up on Eventbrite very, very soon. Once again, thank you all for coming and we'll see you all again in May. Yeah. Thank you so much, y'all. Good night, everyone. Thanks for having me.